thank you. <laughs> this time, maybe you can hear me say that. Um, thank you um, for the workshop to the workshop organizers for pulling this together, lining up a really cool set of um, talks, and um, I'm really honored to be invited. Um, I actually thought Eduardo's talk was a great lead into um, the things I'm going to talk about. Um, I often talk to people who are working on autonomous vehicles, and they just they some of them feel very strongly that we actually need to work in an environment where the AVs, only the AVs are on the road and ideally not anywhere near people because people are completely unpredictable. And I think completely unpredictable and they're like, yeah, oh yeah, that's just completely random, you know? And it's like, it's just a kind of an amazing statement that we can make vehicles, you know, navigate their way down the road in rain and snow and these things, but people are apparently impossible. And I think uh, one of the really important things that um, it's important to acknowledge is that we as people can figure out what other people are doing, but it is a challenging thing. I do think it might be the hardest problem, you know, for autonomous vehicles, just understanding how other people drive and move around, but I don't think it's unsolvable. Um, and so, you know, I think it's an important area of study. So a lot of the way that people who are interested in human factors study how people are going to behave in different situations, they set up driving simulation studies. So this is actually, um, I hope there's enough contrast that you can see. This is actually from a, a shot of my driving simulation lab. We have three screens around a Fiat 500 chassis. And then um, one person basically sits in the driver's seat. And it's basically like a really large theater for just one person. And you know that person is basically um, shown different fictional uh, possible worlds with the, which they can drive through and, and interact with. And so it's actually really important to understand that like the, a driving simulator, uh, like like a game um, environment doesn't just play things at you. you um, your um, actions actually have an effect on uh, the environment. And that's like a really important thing. And that kind of interaction is also what makes studying people um, and their interactions with AVs challenging. Because for example, if you study the way that people move down the road and then you are autonomous vehicle and you expect people to move down the road the same way as you trained, you know, when you were just like driving a normal vehicle, you might be surprised to notice that people behave very differently. You know, when they're driving around or walking around an autonomous vehicle, um, they might stop and stare, you know, stand in the middle of the road and take pictures with their cell phone. And that's very different from what you might model if you just model everyday behavior. So that's uh, what we know in human studies as an interaction effect that the introduction of the stimuli actually creates a different set of behaviors. And so it, you have to use simulation in order to understand, to get enough data to do the um, machine learning to understand how to respond to the way people behave, because otherwise you actually need to have, you know, the autonomous vehicles already. They need to work already and already be programmed so you can understand how people um, are going to react. So that's a chicken and egg problem. So simulation is the way that we get around that. This is I just want to check, were you guys able to watch the video there? And could you hear the sound? Great, super. Okay, so this is the theme of this section, which is that simulations help us anticipate how people are going to behave in different design futures. Um, and this is, um, I'm going to show some slightly more traditional human factor studies we've run in driving simulators. This is one um, that, um, from a study that I did when I was working at Stanford University. Um, and this woman is supervising a autonomous vehicle and she's falling asleep. Um, this seems like something that would be like the worst case scenario or like maybe very, hopefully very rare, but actually lots of people um, who are supervising automation become sleepy. And when we published this paper in 2015, a lot of people were like, what, that's like crazy. But like now that a lot of people have seen how people with Tesla's drip behave, you know, with the autopilot, it's much less shocking. So yeah, this is a study, these are the results from the study that I just showed you the video from where we had people supervising automation or watching a video on iPad or reading on iPad. And this is a within subject study, which means the same people were in every one of these conditions. And you can see that when these people are supervising the autonomous vehicle and pretty much only when they're supervising the autonomous vehicle, they are really sleepy. This is out of 48 participants, 26 people showed, you know, uh, extended eye closes or like yawning behavior. And that hardly happened when people are watching video or reading. And that is um, something that is a really important thing to understand. And the headline of this paper is, 
distraction becomes engagement and automated driving. So literally, the things that we do um, when we are trying to think about public safety for manual driving is to keep people from like looking at their phones or doing things that like might keep them from focusing on the road. Later on, when we have automation, what you're trying to do is make sure that if you need someone to be supervising or watching the car or providing input or catching the car if it does something wrong, that they're awake to do that. And it might actually be important to give them activities to do, ideally not reading passages or watching videos or playing video games, but things that help keep them actively, uh, cognitively engaged so that if you need them, they are available. So, it, I mean, this points out this like really amazing thing, which is that like automated driving um, AVs is, is actually a completely different category of human interaction, you know, than manual driving. They seem similar because you have cars in both of them, but from an interaction perspective, it's actually very, very different. Here's another kind of study that we run, um, a more traditional human factor study. And these are studying unstructured transitions. And these are situations where the car doesn't actually give you any warning that it's going to like need you to take over. It's just uh, because it has a perception problem or a modeling problem, you know, it basically just shuts up automation and it's really up to the user to basically take over. Um, so this is a study where we have a car that's um, driving in an autonomous mode and then either eight, five or two seconds before this like turn, it basically says, you know, automation off because very little warning. And then we basically see how well they drive. Like if the, the user doesn't take over, the car will shoot off the road. And um, if they drive, they have to drive within these pylons and avoid oncoming traffic. So here's an example from the pilot of that study. So that was actually a person doing okay job taking over and like you say, like super stressful. Um, what we found is when you actually tell people they're supposed to be doing nothing more than supervising the car, um, they actually do pretty well in the eight and five uh, second conditions. But then like you can see like more variance in the kind of people's ability to like keep the center line um, or, um, you know, like, you know, manage their steering like, um, in the two second condition. Um, when we had them doing a passive secondary task, this is mostly like reading, you can see that that range is bigger. So people are performing much worse in the two second condition, but still pretty well in the five and eight second conditions. And only when you have them engaged in an active secondary task, we had people playing uh, first person running um, games. Do they, do you actually see like that people even in, with five or eight seconds, like have difficulty taking over? And these are not, you know, hard and fast numbers. I wouldn't guarantee that, um, you know, people would do exactly the same performance on a real world. But you can see that, like, at this two, five, and eight second condition, that like people people are unable to kind of like take over and switch over from task somewhere like with that sort of time interval. So those are kinds of bread and butter type ex experiments. A lot of my colleagues also run those kinds of experiments. And one thing I also really try to do are naturalistic experiments where we really take into account things that are going to happen in the real world. Um, and that is useful not only for getting more ecological validity in the way that we get our studies, making uh, us feel more like we, un we understand what, what will really happen with people in the animal world. And we also can like look a little bit more qualitative with that experience is like, not just like how fast to take over, but is that going to feel okay, even if people don't die, you know, like, is it going to feel dangerous or bad? Um, and so here's an example. This is um, what we call an on the road driving simulator. And this is, you know, if you're a participant in one of these studies, you sit here in the, you know, uh, it's actually the passenger seat of the car in our country. Uh, uh, but then we just tape on a steering wheel in front of the person and, you know, we, we block it so they can't see the actual person who's driving. And then we just ask people to imagine that they're in an autonomous car. And we, um, you know, say that you're going to your friend's house. And then we actually ask them questions about the experience. Um, so I'm going to show you the results from a study where we just asked them to anticipate whether the car was going to turn or not to see if the motion of the car um, helps them understand the car's intent and future action. How did the dive go? Oh, it's pretty amazing. Go, Otto. Oh. 
I guess the computer is pretty cautious, uh, which is pretty awesome. There's a number of obstacles that I could have imagined being pretty troublesome for a computer car. It seems to navigate through them all. A flock of people on the side of the road on this really small street, okay. like construction and like, um, you know, like traffic and um, all these different situations where it just basically did the right thing. It's yeah, it's a much better driver than most humans. Okay. <laughs> uh, so how did the ride go in gentle touch? I was impressed. It went very well. Did you feel nervous at any point? Uh, I did. Um, there was a construction site that we went past. There was a construction vehicle and the guy was waving for me <laughs> to move. <laughs> I sat there like a retard. Like staring at the thing. I didn't like wave to the guy or anything. <laughs> so I was like, I really hope the car does something <laughs> So the car backed up and then the guy made more hand signals. Did you cross the vehicle? I don't know. I just don't fully trust a car to drive on its own. Even though I had no bad experiences with this car, it just seems strange to me still that a car can drive itself. Um, we will now turn on the autonomous control, and the car will now greet you. Car, please say hello. <laughs> did you notice the car say hello? I did. What was it like? Uh, it was an engine roar. Okay. Uh, did it make you feel uncomfortable or hurt you? No, I thought it was very friendly. Was it what you had imagined? It was what I imagined. It was smooth, cautious, but normal driving experience. Yeah. Kind of what makes it cool. I think I was surprised how much I trusted it. Even from the beginning when it said hello, well, that one thing like gave it enough personality for me to trust it. It made me feel like even though it wasn't a human, it wasn't of malicious intent. It just was driving carefully, slowly. Actually, it reminded me of like a driving school instructor. Was this pattern of driving okay with you? No, oh, it was ideal. I could definitely own one of these. How do I buy one? So you think in 10 years? So uh, this kind of driving simulator makes it possible for us to unearth a bunch of things that are going to be important with autonomous cars that we didn't know about. So for example, um, when that woman uh, would describe the situation with the construction vehicle, uh, people who are sitting in the front of the car, if other people gesture at them or like waving at them, they feel responsible for what the car is doing, even though they don't actually have control. You can, you can actually hear, even when she's being interviewed afterwards, the stress in her voice, you know, about that situation. And one thing that we observe, observed in these more qualitative experiments is that people, given the opportunity, will often take over control, even if the car hasn't done anything wrong, if they feel nervous about the car's behavior socially, you know? Uh, so they, they basically want the car to represent them and they don't, they don't feel comfortable if the car is driving in a way that they don't know how to explain, even if it's not um, unsafe. So something like this is like really useful because it brings up all these issues that you otherwise wouldn't know about because you would never think to program something like that into a driving simulator otherwise. Um, Here's maybe the work that we're most famous for. This is a, um, a technique for looking at how pedestrians and driverless vehicles interact. Um, and it's called ghost driver. So there's a person actually driving this car, but the car is in costume. It's just a bucket and a tonic car. And then this is a person in a car seat costume. Some of these bystanders you see on the side are actually graduate students that are waiting to interview pedestrians after they pass.
So one thing I'll mention is that in the first day that we ran the study, we um, were very cautious. We kind of like crept up to the stop sign line. And then when we chased people down afterwards and asked them about the car they passed, they didn't remember passing a car. They didn't actually do the thing that everyone knows that we do when we cross the street, which is make eye contact with the person who's driving the car and make sure you understand what they're gonna do before you cross the road. Very few people did that. And what's going on is that actually we don't do that. You know, like we think we do that. Um, we can remember moments when we've done that. But what actually happens when people cross the road is they basically make an estimation of whether that car is likely to get to the stop sign before them or not. And they actually try to speed up and slow down so they won't even get, they won't even be, have to be an interaction. So we actually had to use, you know, walkie talkies to try to time it so that people actually showed up at the same time as the car. When um, they do show up at the same time in the car and they have to interact, normally what they do is they look at the front bumper and the front wheel of the car and they're trying to determine if the car has stopped and they wait till the car has stopped before they're able to go. And it is only when um, in our subsequent studies, we, well, we would like let our foot off of the gas and then like ease forward a little bit and then uh, set our foot back down on the brake again. It's only when you're not sure what the car is going to do that you look up and try to find someone to communicate with. And, you know, most people seeing that the car has stopped again, and even though they can't see anyone to negotiate with, it's just they like pass in front of them. So interestingly, the thing that we all know that we do, which is make eye contact with the driver, is actually not the normal behavior that pedestrians have with drivers. What the normal behavior is that people don't look and make one uh, early estimation. What we know that we do all the time is If we when just we relied simply, on the oh, oh yeah. it's back. Sorry, the, the audio was caught up. Yeah, oh, yeah no. we lose How your sound you for like one minute. I guess we lose your sound. Oh no. Um no, 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 like have... 20, 20 seconds about okay. Well, anyway, the my 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 assertion is that people don't look when they cross the they make eye contact with drivers when they cross the road. Um so anyway, that sounds like something that you actually need to run a study to find out because if you ask people they will all swear up and down the way I would swear up and down, they make eye contact. Um, and so this um, uh, kind of study, uh, uh, this type of study is actually what most people are now using to do what, what is now called external human machine interaction. They basically wear a car seat costume. And this um, protocol has been ooh, um, replicated by people from Volvo and Eindhoven uh, in the Netherlands at UC San Diego. Uh, BTDI actually had a situation where a news reporter saw one of their vans and like tried to chase them down or hit the news cycle a few years back. And uh, this I really particularly love. Um, John Shuko from Ford actually uh, said when I showed him the early videos of Ghost Driver that that was the stupidest thing he's ever seen. And then he was in charge of this like collaboration with Domino's where they experimented with autonomous pizza delivery and they used this protocol. So you know, I think one of the things that you're seeing is we're doing a lot of things that we're staging situations. And one of the things I think is interesting for this audience who's like interested in AI is that by staging scenarios, you can actually like create situations that don't exist yet and collect data about what is likely to happen in a future scenario, kind of the way you do with uh, simulation, but like, you know, a little bit in, in real world context. Um, this one is a little bit less about autonomous cars, but one like one of the things that we've done in this space, kind of thinking about data sets for interaction in vehicles, is figure out when are good times to talk to people who are driving a car. Um, we have this study called "Is Now a Good Time," and all that's going on in the study is that when people are driving, um, we're basically um, having them drive in an environment that has you know a bunch of different conditions: freeway, expressway, subway, suburban, urban, and we ask them, "Is now a good time?" Every 30 seconds, minute and a half. And if it is a good time, people are supposed to say yes. Otherwise they say no. Um, here's an example. This is like a super cut of all the times that people were saying no. And in tiny text, I don't know if you can see it on your screen. So sometimes people are saying why, you know, we're at the freeway or pulling onto the garage. So uh, because we're capturing in cabin and road video and we have their elicited response as long as, along with their physiological signals and data from the car, we can actually then like make models to estimate like when are good times or not good times to talk to people uh, when they're driving. And like this kind of thing can also be used for, you know, any sort of like autonomous vehicle behavior early on, like looking at whether safety drivers are paying attention, but also 
you know, figuring out whether, you know, the person you're interacting with is able to interact with you or if they're busy. And um, my most recent work now is just thinking about how we can expand these like new ways of doing simulation to actually look at um, the really key issues around interaction in autonomous vehicles. Um, I'm gonna skip this just in the interest of time. One of the things that we're really interested in is the way that um, drivers interact with each other, um, because that's something that's very difficult for autonomous vehicles to understand. Like right now, for example, if an autonomous car gets to a four-way intersection, they actually just wait for everyone else to go you know, because it's difficult to like understand how people are going to like are are fainting with the car about what the who should go first. And so what we've created is a driving um, simulator setup, which ha happens in virtual reality, where you can have two people in the same world, kind of like Mario Kart. Um, but we make it so that you can actually then uh, see how the the drivers are driving signal to each other when you have merge or like passing situations. So here is some video showing how that system works. They can actually see their, their hands modeled in the world. And they can see one another. So this driver on the left is seeing the driver on the right pass first before he goes. And then afterwards, we're able to like rec uh, create the scenario using the data we collected during the run, including where their head uh, position are. So we can actually tell when they're like turning to look at each other. This is at a four-way stop. You can actually see a little bit of that like interaction avoidance behavior. The green car was actually slowing down and trying to wait till the red car went before it went. And then only went ahead because it was clear that the red car was gonna stop. Um, so one of the reasons why we think this is really useful is that this kind of virtual reality setup can be put into a suitcase and brought to different countries. And then we can actually look at the way that people in different countries actually drive um, differently from each other. So actually, you know, the vehicles that we get deployed worldwide, they have some differences, but they're largely the same. However, the way that people drive once you pull out of the garage, you know, and onto the road, you might find to be very, very different. Every time I leave, you know, my home state and have to go someplace and merge, for example, I'm always not clear why no one seems to understand when I want to go in or what I'm supposed to do. So this is um, from a pilot run that we uh, had with this setup at the Technion uh, with our partner, uh, Avi Purush. Um, so you're gonna hear the experimenter speak in Hebrew to these two people. What we see on the screen behind the researcher on the uh, left um, is the, uh, what's the woman on the right sees in her VR goggles. So she can see her gesture because she actually gestures back. That kind of explicit gesturing doesn't happen all the time, by the way, but it's just too cool to like not show everyone. And then after they get through, we have them answer a survey about how that interaction went. All right, so that that's kind of the all of the things I have to show. Um, I just want to end with like like with the statement that the human factor is maybe the hardest and most interesting aspect of autonomous driving. I hope more people who are working on AI for autonomous driving will be interested in that part of the overall problem. Thanks. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah, it was really a wonderful talk, and I have never thought so much about you know the interaction aspect of autonomous driving vehicles. So I think, 
it's definitely very interesting to us and yeah uh, love to like learn more from you like from your future research as well uh, so uh, anyone has questions if so you can just uh, unmute and ask can i ask okay first? i guess i I'm... do have i sure. do have one question that really yeah. like right in my mind uh so you kind of show a lot of example like a lot of these uh study people are doing in interaction really like same like yeah i didn't really see some example like this in the research in the domain that i'm doing like we are doing computer vision we don't really have a lot of study like this so it's really yeah. cool so so the first uh question is that you show like in the very last video right the two yeah. person when they want to some merge or uh like cross each other they show some mm -hmm. gesture to each other so that people mm -hmm. can understand okay you go you go first or i go first right but for mm -hmm. autonomous vehicles um apparently autonomous vehicle does not have hands so there's no way to do gesture but right. we probably still need to understand or need to develop some vision model to understand the gestures by the human or by the pedestrian right so that's right. probably possible i think because I mean, it's just a simple vision model we can develop for sure. But on the other hand, what about the, let's say, the pedestrian, like what kind of signal the autonomous vehicle should send out to the pedestrian to function as the gesture, right? Yeah, so, that's a great question, yeah. So that's from the other hand uh, to think about this problem, right? Because we need to have this mutual information passing, not just, okay, um, the autonomous vehicle can understand pedestrian, but the pedestrian cannot understand all the autonomous vehicles. So what kind yeah. of study you have done before, or what do kind of signal you think or you suggest to, to do in, to solve this problem? Yeah, I mean, I, I focused on, I mentioned that, you know, like we saw these people like gesturing at each other and it's just so cool that you can see that. But most of the time people are gesturing with the car, right? They're moving, using the move, movement of the car, you know, to kind of say like, I'm gonna go, I'm not gonna go, you know, um, and it's kind of amazing how expressive people can be with the car. So one thing that's really interesting about that ghost driver protocol that we developed is that at the moment in you know time that we developed it, a lot of people were working on different kinds of signaling systems for pedestrians. Like they had different kinds of signs or lights that they could put on the dash, you know, or they were playing different sounds. And one thing that um, our protocol made more obvious, and like all the people that ran follow up studies also, you know, found more information about this, is that people are um, modeling whether the car is going to speed up or stop far earlier than you can read any of the signs or hear any of the sounds. They're like determining that someone is stopping for them because they can see the like slowdown, you know, of someone taking their foot off the gas and then putting their foot on the brake. And that is how they detach the side they've been seen, which is like a really interesting thing. And so, um, you know, like if they don't see that kind of behavior, people like don't know what to do and they will just be very cautious. Um, but then if they do see that slow down, they assume that they can go because they've been seen. So it's like very difficult. The car actually, even though it can be drive more efficiently um, by stopping, you know, when it's optimal, they actually have to perform a slowdown as soon as they see a person. So the person knows they've been seen. So it's a lot of things like that. So a lot of the things that people were planning to do actually went out the window. Um, <laughs> and now people are much more focused on motion as gesture. Um, and that's, that's mostly not work that's being done by me, it's being done by the automotive companies, but it's, it's one of those interesting I things see. that now that we have the protocol, we can actually design. Yeah. I see. I see. I see. Yeah. I totally understand your point. It's just like one concern that I had when I, when I watched the video you played. So for example, when the car slowed down and the pedestrian slowed down, but then because of the car seeing the pedestrian slow down, okay, maybe you give uh, a little bit speed up, uh, because you assume mm -hmm. the pedestrian will stop there. But then when you, you mm -hmm. speed up and the pedestrian in the same time speed up because the pedestrian in the last second seeing your vehicle is stopped there. So it's it's like a back and forth uh, reason, yeah. right? Yeah, so yeah. yeah. So interaction is tough because it's not turn. People don't turn take, right? They do it in duplex and it, it requires a lot of contextual information to do well. That's why it's a really tough problem. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I okay, have there's... Um, yeah. Um, sure, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, thank you very much for the talk. I am really interested in the work you do. 
and uh, I learned a lot <laughs> from your methodology. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just uh, wondering if you ever noticed some aggressions from pedestrians in your studies, aggression towards AVs, like maybe grieving the AV, like AV grieving and uh, trying to be malicious to the AV and uh, uh, are there such behaviors in, you know, currently from the studies you have uh, conducted and uh, is there a way to solve this when Thomas Bear could start, you know, coming on our roads, you know, maybe massively? And uh, uh, there have been some work around the uh, explanation provisions, you know, Thomas driving contest. What do you think about this? Uh, do you think uh, explanation is something critical maybe in autonomous driving, especially for stakeholders like passengers and maybe uh, maybe uh, auditors or accident investigators? Yeah, so, I mean, just to try to, I hope I remember all the questions. I mean, I definitely think that, um, you know, now now the, the team at Stanford is calling this this thing where people are giving cars a hard time briefing, you know, and that that is definitely a factor and I think it's increasing. Um, you know, there's actually these news articles about people in Arizona, like kind of attacking autonomous cars with sticks, you know, and, and rocks and stuff. And they, that it's so interesting because the people writing the articles said like, you know, maybe these people are very concerned about loss of jobs, you know, or things. And if anyone has lived or been around these uh, environments where these cars are being deployed, you actually know it's because these cars drive like jerks, you know, <laughs> like, and by, by, by that, I mean, like they, very obviously are not responding to any of the cues that you are giving off and they do not give off any cues and they just do whatever they want to without it. So basically by not interacting, they're really infuriating people. So I think actually figuring out how to make the cars more expressive is actually important, you know, like different kinds of displays. And I think explanation is one of the things that you can do. Like um, if, um, if you make a mistake or a gaffe, you know, in a social situation, like explaining what, what you were thinking is uh, helpful, but even being able to explain that you're sorry says a lot about what you are, um, what, how we should interpret the mistake, right? A mistake is a mistake, but it could be a mistake that indicates that you don't care about other people or it could just be, you know, a blunder. And I think um, not giving an explanation and, but continuing to make these mistakes time and again makes people think like, well, that's, that's just completely jerky behavior. And that helps explain why these behaviors were not, you know, these um, what I think of as bullying or griefing behaviors were not as present before, but they're increasing because, you know, it's built on this like long-term perception of the cars. Um, and I do think, you know, thinking of ways to make the cars be able to express more social signals is going to be important. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. mm. Great question. Okay, we yes. have an, another question from chat. So, uh, okay. Uh, they ask, I wonder if you made parallels or look into ideas from aviation industry, since similar mm -hmm. research has been carried out for pilots uh, before, like uh, aeron aeronautical decision-making and traffic detection. Yeah. So, I mean, I think really early on, like some of the, the earlier studies I was showing, these human factor studies where people are getting sleepy, you know, um, or, and like need activities to help keep them alert. Those are definitely, those results definitely echo results that have been found in the aviation industry for decades. Um, pilots are extensively trained. They're selected from people who um, are very similar to each other. Like actually, you know, like very many of them come from the military and are a certain height and weight, you know, and then they redo training and still it's really hard for them to stay awake. So, um, it's, it's very difficult to, to look at that work and then imagine, you know, like how we can expect people to supervise autom automation without the kinds of interventions that they developed for the pilots, which is our giving them tasks to do to keep themselves awake and then um, helping teach them things while they're behind the wheel, even if they're not driving so that they actually know what to do if there's an accident. Um, I think Ed Hutchins from UC San Diego said it best though. He said the only, um, way in which like the that you know driving is better than flying you know as a problem to solve is that you're already on the ground you can't <laughs> crash into the ground and every other way it's much much harder because you don't have you know interaction with other planes or pilots you know you don't have all these like quite as many situations 
in the air as you have on the ground. And so there's a way in which, um, you know, I think that the autonomous driving human factors issues have really far out past the issues that like aviation can inform now. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I have another question. So I think sure. I just wonder how, you know, human interaction with autonomous vehicles will change after like they get more used to it. Like I think right now many, many behaviors might because autonomous driving uh, vehicles are not so you know, popular and their behavior is not so predictable for humans. I, I just wonder like if we can make their behaviors like setting up protocols or as, as you discussed before, like having some expression for the autonomous vehicles so that they mm -hmm. can become more predictable and people will become, maybe have a better interaction with them. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I expect that um, with good design, it's possible to design these things in a way that people get used to it and are not offended all the time. Just today, I was in an elevator and, you know, there's many aspects of, mm -hmm. of riding elevators that used to be very difficult. Like they used to have to have a person there pushing the buttons, you know, <laughs> even though the, the elevator was automated because people didn't feel totally comfortable with it. But um, the elevator I was in had a door that was very um, quick to close and it felt aggressive, you know, and a little, it was a little scary just how quick it was to close. So even things that are, you know, kinds of automation that we've had for decades we're still working on, mm -hmm. you know, making sure we understand how to make those things work in a way that people feel comfortable around. So I think it's possible. Yeah. I don't think it's easy. I think it'll take some time. Yes, yes. I think your research will definitely help, you know, making the autonomous vehicles more, you know, more sociable and help interact with people better. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I and mean, then mostly they point out the things that we're doing that we don't know we're doing to interact with one another is pretty cool.